But yeah, hi all. I uh, thank you so much for coming, and I'm so excited to introduce Yana Pindell, a self-described citizen citizen scientist, community engaged artist, and educator who centers uh, restoration and indigenous rights in her work. Uh, she's presented in spaces around the country. Spent a year teaching about eco art in Cambodia and is currently an adjunct faculty member at Olympic College in Washington State. Uh, Diana, we're so happy to have you with us and whenever you're ready to start, go ahead. Okay, wonderful. It's good to see people I know and people I don't know. Hello. And I am going to switch to screen, bleh, screen sharing right now. Um, so hopefully, do I need to turn off my video to do that? Nope. Okay, I'll just leave that on and um, switch to share screen and um, hmm. Are you seeing? Oh, the host disabled participant screen sharing. I've got a little pop up that says it's disabled. It should work now. Ah. Excellent. Um, that's the screen and I'm play from start. Okay, hello everybody. Um, uh, <coughs> here I am, Diana Pendel, and oh shoot. Okay. Um, yes, I'm talking to you from the Olympic Peninsula of Washington, USA, which is the traditional lands of the Sklalem people since time immemorial. And I also have a guest with me today um, who is working with me on the, my current, our, our current collaboration, um, Valerie St. Pierre from the Absolut Crow tribe. And she will, um, she'll be joining us at the at, in the last piece of this uh, presentation, excuse me, just a little, little bit of nerves right there. Um, Valerie, can you wave from your image there? You can see here with the lit teepees in the background. So um, she will be coming on um, when we get to that one. And so um, as we. Um, and I want to go back a moment and remember to thank Cameron and the crew, Tyler and Kendall and everyone who's made this event happen. We're so lucky to be able to do low carbon footprint uh, events like this and share all of our knowledge and things. Um, so my approach for today, I, instead of going into a lot of depth about any one particular uh, project, I realized that the people who probably are attending today are interested in uh, art science collaboration, um, communications of science, whether you're coming from the art side or the science side. So I decided to focus today on uh, what I've learned from my projects, both the ones that have been follies and the ones that have gone really well. Every single one of them has been a great learning experience and community building experience. So um, keep your questions in mind. Please put questions in the chat. If you have specific projects, that would be especially fun to um, talk about when we get to the Q&A at the end. So, um, so here's volunteers from various projects. And I have a manifesto that I've been living by for the last decade. Environmental problems are cultural problems, not simply scientific ones. We have enough data to begin. We know what we need to do. Technology is prepared to offer solutions. What is needed is climate change. Excuse me, what is needed is cultural change. And this is why artists must be leaders in collaboration with scientists, community members, and policymakers. Artists provoke the necessary cultural shifts that lead to truly adaptive behavior. And so, our task, those of us who want to work in this art science interdisciplinary area, our task is to help the community bond with their environment people take care of what they love. And so I've been honored to work with such a wide variety of 
people in, uh, in these wonderful projects. So adaptive capacity. Adaptive capacity was my very first real science artist collaborative project. Um, although I'd done you know, a number of uh, collaborative work with theater and other things beforehand. But this one, the American Meteorological Society had hired a, cur a, a curator to find artists and we were paired up, one artist, one scientist, and um, according to our interests, and we were given six months to come up with a way of communicating about climate change. So my artist was, I mean, excuse me, my scientist was Ankur Desai, a biochemical meteorologist, quite a mouthful there. And the screenshot in the bottom is us at the opening when we finally actually met in person for the first time and the sculpture, not very visible there, but it was, it was a lot of fun and there was a small pamphlet that came out. And so we learned a great deal from this project. This is the sculpture I finally produced based on our uh, many talks that Encore and I had. And um, so Encore's research focused on four systems that had burned due to the expansion of the bark beetle population across forests. And the bark beetles, of course, were proliferating due to the warming planet, the lack of winter cold. I was interested in the ways that the bark beetle gets demonized in the press and even in science articles. You know, the bark beetle is responsible for the devastation of, you know, these forest fires going uh, being much more devastating than they normally would have been. And that is a really anthropocentric view. Um, we're deflecting from our human culpability and also kind of ignoring the essential role and the natural role of the bark beetles and the fire in helping to con help conifer forests to regenerate. So a big part of what we came up with here is um, our language. And how do we know what we know? Um, and why do we know it? And how do we share it? Which are all epistemology. And a real turning point for me was when Ankur showed me the, um, I don't know if you can see my little arrow here, but the uh, equation at the bottom and which I'm like, you know, very minimal math understanding. But when he showed me this, he told me how much he loved that, this um, statement here, because when he sees it, he sees an entire description of a, of a meteorological system within this one phrase. And um, I still get a little bit of chills. It's like, so that's poetry. He's speaking, it, it's a different language than English. But then my visual work is also a different language than English non-verbally. So, um, so I suddenly realized that we could really bond through our alternative languages. And that also speaks to um, the different languages of uh, interspecies, multi-species multi communications about the system that those species live in. Um, so one of the things that was also really key that I, want, that I think you can take away for any collaboration is that I, we were several months into it. We were like three or four months into it before I actually stu stood back a moment and realized that I was doing, um, we were both doing kind of traditional roles in that we both were like, buying into the idea that the scientist had the important data and that the artist was the um, going to be the communicator of that important data. And so a little bit of a hierarchy there. So I um, did some study into collaborative styles and there's a lot of different kinds. And my mentor, my faculty mentor at the time in my master's thesis pointed out that they're all good. The point is to be aware of what your collaborative 
style is going to be, how decisions are going to be made, um, and you know, will you have 100% consensus? Will you, will, will you all take different areas that you have complete control over, et cetera? So um, it, the important thing is to communicate about that and understand what your expectations are and what you want to have. So um, yeah, and um, so that happens across species, as you can see there from my dog and my chick. So slow art at Otter Creek. This is the largest piece that I did during my time studying for my master's thesis. It's actually formed the basis oops, for my thesis and my practicum. I went to Goddard, um, which is, has an interdisciplinary arts program for the master's thesis. And we're, we have to take on a practicum, a practical project out in the world where we have to do everything we need to do um, uh, in research and things, but also make something happen out in the world based on our studies. So this, is, this ended up being my thesis project, but also it went along for another couple of years after that, um, five years in total. It was not ever actually built, but I absolutely did not consider that a failure because I learned a lot, I participated, um, I was able to create some uh, real changes in how the project was done and uh, reaching out to you know, the historical society with some information that they hadn't had, reaching out to the Department of Ecology and getting them to add a section to the remediation that they were working on that they had not noticed so um, all in all, this is an important piece to me. And the, here is just a few of the pieces of the phases of this project. So starting with the upper left-hand corner, you can see the culvert that I initially was attracted to thinking that that would be my practicum and it would be over in six months, right? <laughs> And it just happened that I was fortunate, sorry, my button's pretty sensitive there. Uh, fortunately, it just happened that the DOE was in the last stages of preparing for and planning for uh, large scale remediation of the site, as you can see in the central photo. Sorry, better not touch my mouse. Um, and so it made for a perfect synchronicity of learning uh, experiences and investigations of the grounds and history, um, the history of the beehive kilns in the upper area. It had been an old iron and steel plant in a very, um, in the, you know, 1900s. So there was a lot of history there and some rubble that had been, um, you know, for the round beehive kilns left on the beach, just about to wash away. The, the historical society was super interested in. Um, and so some aerial shots. And so this is this collage gives you a little bit of the idea of the extent of the research. And my point here is that when you take on a piece, there's going to be a lot of research. And the broader um, the broader uh, viewpoint that you can take in your research, the more of a systems uh, approach you can be taking. So the DOE was only interested in the science of remediating some of these little brownfield areas. Um, but by the end of it, because I involved uh, the county and the history society and so on, it became a much more of a systemic um, uh, solution. And I'll, let's see. So this is actually the list of some of the um, pieces that I studied and wrote about. I wrote as a manual as part about this project. Um, for my thesis, of course, the project wasn't even finished at that point. And 
I've gone ahead, I'm still working on it, and I'm actually a, want to finish it as a reference. And so down in the corner on, on my website, I have a, I will, I'm opening up the draft to you all at, at this stage. So people who are um, interested in the Enviro Art Gallery, um, your associates and everything for about a week, I'm gonna leave that handbook available to you to um, download. So I've got, I'm not gonna discuss all of these steps in this talk, but these are the pieces that are in the handbook. And my entire goal here is um, to facilitate this movement that I think is really crucial for us at, at this urgent time. So um, I know Kendall was, I asked Kendall to put up the uh, link in chat. So I suspect she's done that when you get there. If you like it, you can buy me a coffee, but <laughs> that's not required. This is, I, I want this information out there. So the next project to talk about is the Soil Remembers, which was a, a fun project for me because Dr. Rhonda Yankee, who is a PhD in soils and teaches organic agriculture, she was also secretly taking her MFA with me in, in our program, interdisciplinary program, her school actually didn't allow <laughs> the scientists to go and study um, for another art degree, but she did it anyway, she figured, you know, but so, so it was fascinating. We came to this with both of us having a strong understanding of the ability of art and science to, um, to, influence each other and really help each other. And so we made this project. The school meets at Fort Warden, which is an old military fort that's become a, um, a state park now and also a community educational center for the Olympic Peninsula region. And so we basically found eight locations. Rhonda did the science of researching all the soils and creating all the soils aspects of the um, project. We had other friends and um, artists and scientists who volunteered for portions of the uh, science. You can see us down below um, taking <clears throat> soil samples that were going to be studied by Rhonda students back in Kansas. And so they helped to identify the eight areas that we would be working with. And we made these signs. And so the design of the signs is intentionally meant to look something like typical park signs so that the community, a community person might say, well, that looks odd. It's different from your usual park sign, but it still looks kind of like, you know, the standard, there's a four by four post and there's the angled thing. We made our own soil paint out of the soil of the area. And uh, part of that was Rhonda's research. I took on the project management and design side of the project while she took on the science and then we collaborated on the actual art making part of it here. So they're short so that hopefully young people can feel like touching them. Um, there was brochures, there were posters, there were little cards and that were actually in an envelope at each um, site so that if somebody just came upon them as they're walking the trails, <clears throat> they could take one. <clears throat> Excuse me just a moment. Mm. And we tried to make them really playful, of course, as you can see by the close-up. My name is Agnew. Where does soil begin? That was uh, our approach. We wanted this to tell something about the history of the fort from the point of the view of the soils and of the microbes in the soil. And to that end, we wrote a microbe manifesto. And whoops, back one. Yeah, so. Um, the micro micro manifold. Sorry. <laughs> um, in order to form a more perfect onion, is the start of our micro manifesto that talks about 
the multi-species um, aspect of this project. So all in all, one thing I learned about this piece, <clears throat> the political side of it uh, was much easier than, for instance, the slow art project had a lot of layers of bureaucracy. This one, the college had already gone out and um, made a connection with the State Park Development Authority in order to facilitate <clears throat> student projects on campus. So we had a great bonus there. So if you've got a project in mind that you want to initiate as an, as an artist or a scientist, getting some kind of initial institutional support right away is going to be really helpful. I found <laughs> that just gives a little extra support. If you happen to be teaching, as I do now, um, having my college uh, on, this, on my side is um, also another way to get an institutional bit of support or you know, however you can approach it, uh, keep that in mind as a benefit. So um, let's see, I'll move on. I'm moving rather quickly actually. So hopefully there's a lot of questions. Co-symmetry. This is the piece that I did in Cambodia. Uh, once again, um, my real collaborator initially was Mui Yu, the woman that we can see on the left-hand side of the screen. And she is a founder of a Montessori school in rural Cambodia. And you can, that's the, an image of the school down on the bottom corner. So this one came about in a really synchronicity kind of way, really surprising and very nourishing, I think, for us. My husband had been to Cambodia a couple of years prior. He had made friends with Mui um, while she was starting her school. And he had also made a few other friends among Khmer people. So we had a couple of contacts there. And when Rich was diagnosed stage four with cancer, the one thing he wanted to do was return to Cambodia. So we reached out and told Mui that, uh, that we were coming. We had other things we wanted to do while we were there. And her response was that she really wanted an eco art project on her Montessori campus. She actually knew about eco art and she wanted a floating island restoration. So that was real exciting for me. So the next several months, I was researching um, very heavily about the processes about floating islands. And up here, you see several different drafts that I sent to Mui and that she would comment back about what was relevant and what she liked. And she was very interested in the piece that you can see the four, uh, the four petaled lotus flower uh, it's a it's called a kabakmai ornament design, the lotus flower, and it's meaningful um, uh, culturally as well. So that was a place where we wanted to go beyond just making an island, but actually making something relevant. And um, you can see the proposal drawing in the, at the bottom. And Mui had several asks also that she really wanted to um, have happen. She wanted it to be an educational project that the children were involved in. And she really wanted it to have um, an ecological impact, which I'll show you in the next slide. But here, I'm just showing some images of the way that I approached the research. Uh, there was a lot of information out and research about what makes the system of a floating island work. Um, and I, so I studied it from the science side, tried to learn about what kinds of plants worked, what kinds of, you know, how to make benefit the root systems and make them healthy and things. But I also looked at other eco art projects and the lower left one by Jackie Bruckner, it's called Veden Taika, it's in Finland. And so there was an enormous, uh, 
lake there, as you can see, that was also an outflow from a sewage treatment plant. So it really needed some ecological restoration. So they had more funding. They were able to make a really large island here using some industrial uh, platforms, like certain kinds of rubber that, and flotation that were then covered with the native grasses and um, lightweight concrete fake stones that also provided some bird habitat. It's a beautiful, beautiful project um, that had a great deal of collaboration between science, scientists, students, ecologists, the uh, sewage infrastructure um, people, administrators and workers and so on and so forth. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Research obviously continued after I got there and <clears throat> Dr. Tabor Hand actually was living in Phnom Penh. So I was able to find him once I got there and he was working on a project to um, create sanitation for the people who lived on the lakes, the families who live there year round. Um, and in the summer, maybe the water outflow from their hygiene would, uh, you know, uh, recirculate well enough. And in the winter, it would get really stagnant, or I should say the rainy season and the dry season rather than winter and summer is more applicable. Um, and so he had created this uh, method where each house would have its own little hygiene pond um, that with water hyacinths that would actually process the, uh, the toilet and before the water was eventually released. So that was an awesome resource. You can see in the lower areas um, we had, it was a real adventure to try to find the right kinds of plants uh, and load them up in uh, Molly's Tuk Tuk, going around to um, uh, all the different places because the language barrier, because none of the nurseries used the Latin names for anything. And I certainly couldn't find out the Khmer names for a lot of these plants. And the one in the very lower right, I especially am, am proud of that one because all I could find out from asking um, Khmer people who actually knew what kinds of plants would work well in water was they would sort of shake their heads and they say, well, it translates to water banana plant. <laughs> so, um, but eventually we were able to put it together, getting photographs from the, the, what was planted at a museum and so on and so forth. But I will never forget about the water banana plant. And these are a number of pictures from the uh, different aspects of that trip. All in all, we were um, at Bowie's place for a month, I believe, four weeks. And we also spent a couple weeks in other, at an elephant sanctuary and things. But the upper right-hand corner, you see that large fishing net of empty bottles. So the thing about Cambodia is that they don't have clean water infrastructure. Everybody uses bottled water, even in Phnom Penh. Um, you know, every, but the hotel we were at, which is really pretty open, just like what you're seeing there, um, people get their water delivered by five gallon uh, jugs. So if you have money, you get those refilled. But here in a rural area, they also do not have garbage infrastructure and recycling infrastructure on any kind of a large scale. So that was a big point that Marie wanted me to use the water bottles and um, work with that. So it's, you can see the pictures of the students learning how to, we invented a way of um, putting them together. It was astonishing how hard everybody worked from child to adult. Uh, Barack in the upper corner testing out our first flotation test with the um, bottles underneath the bamboo. Down in the other corner, burlap sacks were another thing that were very, very available. And coir, coconut coir, uh, is a great 
substrate for these plants. Um, and of course, that's a classic typical street dog in Cambodia. They all look like that. They're just amazing, wonderful little dogs. And of course, in the other corner, uh, float day, the first day that the island was actually launched, the entire school had a big parade and it was so exciting and so much fun. And then of course, as it was, soon as it was put in the water, Mui told the students not to go out there and climb on it, which promptly, they all ran out there. <laughs> so uh, it was a really good test. We were able to discover that it was going to support a great deal of weight as the plants um, grew and uh, developed in it. And there's a picture of after launch day with Barack hanging a flag that Mui had embroidered. She called it Richard Pendel Island, but I call it Cove Symmetry, which means uh, Symmetry Island. And then uh, one year later, someone sent me the picture of how it's thriving there along with the water, the plants along the banks. And people documented lots of, we found fish actually the day after it was launched, um, just having a shady spot in there, the fish immediately came um, to live in it. There's a small five minute film on my website if you want to uh, learn more about how this project uh, went, as well as a lot of, um, um, sorry, other pictures and things. And let's see. Moving on to the, sorry, looking at my pages here. Um, the next piece is Le Schutzing on campus, which is the one that I would, I'm inviting Valerie, who is my partner there. And um, so Valerie is absolutely crucial to our collaboration. We met, um, we had both, it was so interesting. And we met in, in 2018 and we had both been thinking about the need for the language of the traditional peoples of the area to be on campus. And we were both coming at it from different angles. I was coming at it from the public art aspect and she was coming at it from the cultural aspect as a cultural leader um, on campus with the indigenous students. Valerie, uh, can you in a moment unmute for just a moment and say hi to everybody? Hello. And, um, hey, hey, in my uh, language, I'm Absaloga, so I would say, hey, Shoda J, hello, how are you? Valerie, I, I'll talk about these two slides and then I'll, I'll let you talk some more about whatever aspects of the, of these, of it that you want to talk about, okay? Um, so we made a proposal drawing, which is the one in the lower corner, of course. Um, and we received a major grant for it, the Robinson grant, it was, um, which was thrilling for me. Of course, even with that, I think we're both making about 25 cents an hour now <laughs> it, uh, for the time we actually ended up putting in. But um, Valerie uh, was the leader of the, in the Multicultural Center and the Indigenous Students Clubs on campus. So there's an image there showing uh, at least one of her, um, one of the partners in the club. And th the idea was to have the indigenous students really take lead on a lot of aspects of the project, including choosing what words we would use, what kinds of designs we would use. COVID really um, has made a major interruption because nobody could meet really to work on this. So, but there's an image of Valerie in the lower corner blessing one of the locations, which I think is, I, I love this picture because you can see the spray paint from the utility markings, such a Western approach, and then Valerie blessing the land, which is such an oppositional approach. Um, we did hire uh, some Coast Salish artists to do the design work and then students have been learning the processes and learning to glaze and things like 
uh, that. So right now we're um, we're three years into the project. A lot of the clay has been carved and partly fired. Uh, none of it's been installed yet on campus, but that's uh, coming up as as we can figure it out as we get over COVID. Valerie, you want to say something? Um, yes, yeah, so when I met Professor Pindell, um, I was telling her about my ideas and what I felt about the campus. And um, when you're a visiting tribal member, you learn at least a few of the words and know the land that you are visiting. So I'm a visitor. And um, as I looked around campus, knowing that we, we sat on original uh, Suquamish and Duwamish tribal lands, and there was no recognition of that. And I looked in every building, every hallway, you know, I even checked to see if there was a bench, maybe a mention or a tree or something. And that's when I had felt that um, there needed to be some sort of representation of the people that um, were the original guardians. And so part of my independent study was um, uh, um, finding out how to implement uh, using the um, land acknowledgement um, in, in areas on campus, like before meetings. Um, um, before ball games, um, before any event. Um, and so the um, Native students, um, we had participated in the Student Color of Conference 2017-2018. Um, and um, we also attended the um, Washington uh, Student Engagement um at the capitol and uh, met other indigenous students from across the state um and washington has 29 federally recognized tribes so <laughs> that's a lot of different tribes and a lot of different languages but the importance to me was to represent have some sort of representation honoring the the Suquamish and the duwamish and the language of the land which is the lushootsi language um, the Suquamish tribe had opened up their um, language house and started um, language uh, lessons. And I started taking the uh, language classes and um, let my instructor know um, why I was taking the, the language and that it was part of my project um, on campus and but when we we had created the uh, indigenous club on on campus we knew that we wanted to erect some sort of um, honorary piece to to the people but we weren't sure what that looked like and Deanna was listening you know uh, she was listening and uh, came to me with a proposal and I was all excited about it. This is this is great, and so we've been working on this together for a long time, and um, <laughs> it's we're going to complete it. And um, every step of the way is, you know, creator's timing and and not ours. So I, I'll respect that and and just keep working. So I would like to. Uh, at least pronounce one of the words. And I joined Valerie for quite a bit of the lessons, which are, uh, it's a really beautiful language, but the word um, is the word in that central piece, the place of the clear salt water. And that's the name for, the, the Suquamish name for that uh, land. Um. I'd also like to share that um, last year's graduation was the first 
um, time ever that Olympic College had the um, Atlantic acknowledgement read. And I hope that's the first of many. Um, and the um, Indigenous Club was, was able to be a part of it. So, and I was able to um, talk about the uh, Lushoot Seed Language Project on campus. Yeah, there's, people are very, very supportive and recognizing the need for this. So I just have one more slide and then we're opening it up for Q&A. So if you've got more questions for Valerie or about any of the projects or just general questions about um, uh, collaborations, love to hear more of that. And the final slide is just to think about what it is that eco-artists can bring to the table. Um, all artists get trained in some of these, some. Uh, but artists who are trained in eco art or socially engaged art and things like that might be a little more conscious about the um, about our collaborative abilities. And these are, you know, some of these overlap with scientists, like the need for experimentation and research. Artists are, con I mean, every project we do is new, right? So we're constantly experimenting and researching which also means that we bypass failure a lot as a concept because it's okay, that didn't work, but what did I learn? What do I want to try next? You know, just, it could feel like failure. Other people might say, well, that project didn't get built, so it failed, but uh, we, it can take a very a different view of that. Artists think uh, in terms of systems thinking, and that's why working in community is, so important because the the uh, people are as much a part of if we don't get our citizens to bond with their environment we're not going to succeed in long-term systems change um, we're trained in divergent thinking uh, brainstorming coming up with new um, uh, possible solutions the whole out of the box thing we're very used to thinking in terms of nonverbal metaphors, layers, uh, right brain lateral types of thinking. And then of course, we're also trained in trying to, um, to un understand how to reach out into culture, how, to, how some people say it's reaching out to bring heart to projects and to connect with people um, or, Others, you know, empathy. I like to think in terms of empathy towards the multi-species uh, things, uh, critters, um, and other artists have made similar lists. There's different diagrams and things you can look at, but I hope that gives you an idea of what's valuable, especially people who are trained as hardcore scientists um, have different, but often overlapping um, interests that uh, we can share. So with that, I'd like to um, pause. I guess I'm pausing the share. Oops, nope, don't wanna do that. I'd like to go back to <clears throat> mm, stop share. There we go. Ah, there we go. So, um, and open it up to questions and conversation. And I'd love to hear back from each of you, whether you're approaching this as a, from the ecology science side or the communications art side or whatever, please. <laughs> Let's have a look as there, if there's anything in the chat. Uh, thank you for posting that link there. I know that Kendall is and uh, Tyler are both coming at it from the ecology policy and science communication sides of this. It's very exciting to me to see young people understanding how important interdisciplinary work is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, first off, I, I just wanna say thank you so much for your, your talk. This, this has been awesome so far. Um, and yeah, like going off of what you just said, I, I say that my first question goes back to that hierarchy that you mentioned near the beginning of your talk, 
about uh, that can sometimes be like drilled into us about um, placing science above art. Mm. And I'm curious about, uh, you described some of the things that people can do to kind of combat that hierarchy, but I was curious if you had any examples from your time of working with scientists of times when you've had to do that and how it turned out? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it, that's kind of the part of showing the difference. Like when I was working with scientists who have already been like the first one on core, uh, he had at least shown interest by being, you know, volunteering for this program to get partnered. So um, he's a very gentle and generous man. Um, and of course, when I worked with Dr. Yankee, Rhonda, you know, she was coming at it from the same point of view as I was. Um, it's definitely a conversation that uh, needs to be considered. Um, it's, but it hasn't been that hard, I, I think, for me to, to talk to scientists like in the, in the other parts. Um, I, I think humility is the biggest part. And I imagine that's not a difficult um, thing for most of you in this group, um, as far as uh, acknowledging, you know, that the other person's perspective is really important. As an artist, uh, you know, I think we need to sometimes be, uh, I've had to learn to be a lot more assertive about um, how I can be useful, I think. Um, um, sorry. <laughs> blank in a little bit um the you know what i i just blanked out on what i was gonna say um about that i'm sure there's more keep keep going with the keep the conversation going <laughs> um i think you tyler coming at it from the point of view of, of a science communicator um, you're in a perfect position, actually, to point out uh, to especially older scientists who may, for whom this may be a completely new concept. Um, that was how the AMS uh, Meteorologic so Meteorological Society thing got started, was that someone came to them and said, hey, look, this is a great idea. Why don't you hire a curator? Why don't you do this? So somebody actually set that up. And they were wide open to the idea and, you know, it all came together that way. So that would probably be a, a place where you could find yourself very valuable, actually. So. <laughs> I'll save your, I'll save your email. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, no, certainly. Yeah. 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 I, you know, um, more other questions. I don't know if I answered that well, but. No, you totally did. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really enjoyed how um, you connected with the people with the um, floating island park project, mm -hmm. you know, and uh -huh. just like you, you are with this project, mm -hmm. you, you're connecting, you, you know, you were taking the classes, connecting with the people and the language and mm -hmm. um, how you, delve into your projects you know and um not just surfacely i'm i'm amazed every day i'm learning something about you and i'm like wow oh <laughs> valerie valerie's sweet because i i think that i have far more learned from you actually um you know and coming to understand a lot more about indigenous culture and about you know collaborating with you um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, you've taught me a lot about like protocols and things like that. And I think we've both been surprised at things like some, sometimes the way that even you as a crow person might still find it a little bit difficult to uh, gain entry with the Suquamish um, as mm. far as information about language and things like that. Um, I would say for me, my, my biggest lesson is to like learn humility <laughs> and, and learn to um, keep making space for 
you know, the other points of view. Mm. And it's been a so, long time too. I appreciate your perseverance and your patience. It's it, um, creator's time, you know, so. Um, <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> I, I can't, I can't, I can't fight that or change it. So, you know, I get frustrated, you know, when we were getting into our second year when things should have already Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. I felt like a little schoolgirl when we got our when we got our cement mixer. I was. <laughs> yeah. I know that may not seem like anything to anybody else, but it was a big deal. <laughs> it just meant if this is going to happen. Yes, it did. It does. And so I go in there and I put my arms around our pallet of cement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so you know my first thought when we were talking about this I'm not an artist in in that realm or with that kind training. of medium right so You're, yeah in training mm -hmm. and um so the the whole thing was okay we're going to I'm going to take the language so that I can help the students that are cuz I thought it was going to be the the clay club Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the um, ceramic students that were going to help us create these ceramic tiles for our, mm -hmm. for our pillars. And that was okay because that's their thing. You know, it's, mm -hmm. I had never touched clay before. You know, that's just not my thing. It's beautiful. I can appreciate it, but it's mm -hmm. okay. So then <laughs> Professor Deanna says, oh no, I've put in the proposal that the indigenous students are going to be helping with the art. <laughs> my eyes got all big and I'm like, oh. <laughs> I got some creative indigenous students. Okay, this will work not including myself, you know, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just take the pictures and take notes and, you know, and keep mm -hmm. going to class, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I have been, I have learned so much um and and here's that word again mm -hmm. the connectedness mm -hmm. the connecting to the medium that you were working with whatever it is mm -hmm. um my when i took ceramics my um one quarter to get a feel for this project you know when, it was so therapeutic for me. I'm like, wow, you guys get to do this all the time. You know, it, <laughs> it really, and I would often share with her that um, most of my best work I did with my eyes closed, you mm -hmm. know, but it was about feeling it and mm -hmm. not taking in the, the visual eye, using another sense, sensory, you know, mm -hmm. and my bowls, looked better when my eyes were closed <laughs> but I loved it I loved that I had mm -hmm. I had to create that relationship with that medium you know with the clay mm -hmm. and so I enjoyed it so now I'm kind of you know itching for the for the campus to open back up again because I'll be part of the clay club too <laughs> you know Valerie just reminded me of something else that is really I can't emphasize enough like how much more successful each project became when we reached out and added more the involvement of the various stakeholders. So like Valerie mentioned, like we got the ceramics uh, club, the clay the student clay club was gonna help us by mixing clay and things and the ceramics faculty volunteered uh, the, uh, to allow us to use the kilns and the environmental students and, Valerie's uh, military and veterans group was going to veterans. help with a lot of the actual physical work of, of doing the concrete and installing. Things. And that's been true of all of my projects. Um, and so like even one like slow art where I really would consider that kind of a hierarchical project because I was very much the lead uh, in that with and trying to coordinate all of my stakeholders and volunteers and things. Whereas with Valerie, we're like co-collaborators and you know everything happens by consensus. Um, 
even though we have somewhat of a division, you know, she's the cultural leader in the project, I'm the project manager and, and um, infrastructure person. But again, just having that, those decisions, but also it's surprising how many people, if you have a good idea, everybody wants a good idea. So I absolutely mm -hmm. encourage you, like reach out everywhere you can think of. Um, whoever might even have a remote interest in an area that you're thinking about. So um, I know I know we're over one at after one. Uh, are there any other questions or thoughts anybody wants to share? <laughs> I would love to hear just how you became interested in eco art and doing these collaborations. Like, I don't know if there was something, if you had always been doing eco art or if there was kind of a moment of inspiration for you, but I would just love to hear a bit more of the stories behind the stories you shared with us today, because um, they were wonderful. Well, just really briefly, um, I started doing, uh, I, I went to art school uh, throughout my mid twenties because my dad wanted me to be a scientist and I failed in chemistry. <laughs> I completely disappointed him. But um, th then I went to art school and uh, there was just the barest few people who were even doing anything to do with real eco art. People like Buster Simpson. I don't know if, if either of you have heard of him, but one of the earliest things, and he did this performance piece where he made these huge limestone things that look like rollades, and he dived into an acid, a, a river that had been acidified by um, acid rain and called the project River Rollades. But of course, as the limestone dissolves, it remediates the river. Um, you know, so just at, there was just a hand, tiniest handful of people who were even starting to think about actual remediation um, in outdoor projects at that time. And because I'd failed, I thought, I don't know anything about science. I have no freaking idea how he came up with that idea about rollates. And so I spent like the next 20 years, <laughs> well, maybe, you know, like the next uh, mm, mm, uh, 15 or something after I heard about that, you know, in total admiration and, and confusion about how that would happen. And uh, a, a lot of the projects that he did. Um, and then, and then it wasn't until I was in my forties and actually went to graduate school uh, that I had the self-confidence to believe that I could and that Goddard was a school that would uh, support that, you know, some of the mentors were actually uh, uh, consider themselves eco artists as well as performance artists and things like that. Um, so it was a long road, but which is part of why I'm, I'm such a, um, why I have a manifesto and why I have uh, such a passion for sharing what I've learned, like that little handbook that I'm writing is what I wish I had had way back when. So the world is changing in, in a really exciting bunch of ways. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Nice and quiet. I see somebody else down there who is actually from the Coast Salish ancestral lands on, on the, uh, the bottom square. Hi, Andy, whether you're listening or not. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, I'm also uh, a Goddard MFA. Sweet. Awesome. Feel free to get in touch with me at some point. I would love to. Um, yeah, I found out about this uh, on our Facebook. Excellent. Oh, that's very cool. I, I'm excited. Go ahead and, and reach out to me. So at some point, I'd love to. Have some, I know there's a few of us at Goddard over the last few years who graduated and um, we really should be more connected. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to be done in uh, December. They've switched our schedule around. So um, 
So, so finishing early. <laughs> Yay! I'm actually working on my packet right now. <laughs> I know you could use this, right? Like this is a reference for your packet. <laughs> Good, yeah. Is in the packet, so um, very awesome. This was great. Um, I appreciate you sharing this. Thank you. Mm. All right. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Of course, yeah. Thank you so much for coming. This was such is what a wonderful thing uh, for us to be able to hold this space together and yeah just I just want to we're you know clapping and I haven't found a good way for Zoom applause but thank you so much for being here um and yeah yeah uh, you guys are of course welcome and encouraged to come to our other events both for Eco Arts Month and for this week's uh other Enviro Art Gallery speaker series so they're all on the website mm -hmm. um yeah we hope to see you there very much looking forward to hearing uh, so many of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of good stuff. Thank you both. Thank you so much. <laughs>